Greetings. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's session, Engaging Students with Online Breakout Room Group Activities. I, I did say the room and group because these terms can sometimes be used interchangeably. Uh, the, the actual, I guess, the, the feature uh, in online uh, web conferencing uh, software is a digital room, um, but the actual functionality is, is, is a group. Uh, concept. So today, engaging students with online breakout room group activities workshop. Now, this workshop deviates somewhat from my um, uh, typical breakout group uh, workshops. Normally, the focus would be on creating and breaking uh, using breakout groups or rooms within the context specifically of Blackboard Collaborate, and that's what we're using today, Blackboard Collaborate. However, in this revised version. I'm going to speak a bit more broadly, encompassing uh, other web conferencing platforms that we, we use and uh, increasingly used, and they're all accessible from within Blackboard. They include Blackboard Collaborate, Zoom, and Microsoft Teams. Now, well, I'll be talking about the technology a bit. I want to spend a good amount of time talking uh, about pedagogical considerations when working with breakout groups. So uh, it's not so much a workshop on the mechanics of creating breakout rooms or groups uh, as much a, as it is on creating breakout room uh, group activities. And, and that's uh, the reason for the, the, the title, uh, the name or the, what we're using in the title. Now, I, I'd also like to make a further distinction between this workshop and one conducted by my colleague, Amanda Smothers, uh, which is called Facilitating Group Work Online held earlier this semester. Her focus on group work generally uh, in either uh, an asynchronous or synchronous setting where there's an established group or team uh, who are collaborating on a project. My focus is on a synchronous session where group activities takes place during a live session between two or more students in a breakout room uh, for a certain purpose. Now these student pairings should uh, could be between students who have been assigned to work on a semester long group project. However, it's also likely that the pairing is only temporary with students uh, not having previously interacted with each other. I'm Dan Cabrera, the Multimedia Coordinator for uh, the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. I, in addition to offering workshops uh, on multimedia related uh, topics, I also uh, provide consultations for faculty and teaching assistants and uh, create content for the university for our department, uh, including uh, articles uh, for our department, and constantly involved in professional development uh, for, for either the, the university uh, faculty and staff or myself, which I think is a great perk in this uh, in this position. Um, let's see. So today, the agenda, or you could also think of it as is um, the objectives for today's workshop is by the end of the workshop, you should be able to describe the purpose and the function of breakout group room activities, discuss the pedagogical rationale and benefits for incorporating breakout groups and group activities, list four steps involved in designing and implementing breakout group activities, examine the issues, preparation, and pedagogy of breakout groups, Compare and contrast features of three popular web conferencing tools. I, I mentioned, uh, let's see, Blackboard Collaborate, but we'll be looking at Zoom and Microsoft Teams. And then list examples of breakout group activities, and we can discuss those as well. So my question to you, Deborah, Henna, and Zach, um, I'm going to ask you to put your uh, response to these questions in the chat area, OK? so. Uh, what do you think is the function or purpose of group activity? And, and this could be in a face-to-face -face setting, it, it could be online, but in the past, if you've used group activities, how, how do you use those things? Okay, Deborah says, engage students, get them thinking. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, you stole my thunder. <laughs> You're right, Deborah. Absolutely. That's, that's a great reason to do that. How about uh, Hannah, Zach? Let's see, spur uh, creativity, yes, actually, uh, absolutely. Uh, there's nothing like having more than one person who are, who are both working on something at the same time and who can share, you can share, bounce ideas off each other and then maybe maybe something will occur to you that that um, is um, maybe something that might not have happened without that interaction, okay? So those are good, those are good purposes for group activity. What are some of the benefits of group activity? 
Now, off the top of my head, I'm thinking, well, you know, being in an online environment, uh, not really meeting face to face, you might feel a little isolated. I don't have to talk as <laughs> I don't have to talk as much. Thank you, Deborah. That's right. You know, you inv you invite the students to um, to share their ideas, um, their response to questions that you might have. Absolutely good. Um, but you know, having students who are able to to just interact with each other uh, on a somewhat social level is tremendous in terms of creating that sense of community that we all hope for uh, in, our, uh, in our courses, especially if they're an exclusively online environment. Um, people can feel separate. Originally, I was gonna have this activity. Okay, Hannah says, give the students opportunities to apply concepts learned in class. Yes, Hannah, you must be looking at my notes. Somehow you got them. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, it was at this point I was gonna begin the breakout group session to have that, but um, since we have an uh, an odd number, not an even number of, of participants. I think it makes sense just for us to share uh, in this main room and also to, um, to to share the the chat in the chat area. So let me um, let me go to my response to this, and you'll see that there is a lot of similarities between what you guys have shared in in responding to my questions. So group work can be an excellent way to engage students in an online course. Now, when effectively implemented, students working in groups or teams can foster critical thinking and dynamic interaction in an online environment. In addition, studies show that when students work as a team, they develop positive attitudes, they solve problems more effectively, and they experience a greater sense of accomplishments. Those are fantastic benefits for, uh, for group activity. In traditional face-to-face -face courses, instructors can break students into small groups, say, you go over here in this corner, you and that group goes over there on the other side of the room, and you have them collaborate on assigned tasks. Now, this provides students opportunities to work, to promote critical thinking and discussion, to encourage social interaction, which I mentioned just a minute ago, and then gain insight from their fellow students as they collaborate to solve problems. Students can re then return to the larger class and they can share their findings. And, and, and this is what Deborah was saying, so I don't have to talk so much. <laughs> Absolutely, you bring them back like this and they can share what it was they found. Now, the same benefit can be experienced by online students using web conferencing tools such as Blackboard Collaborate, Zoom, and Microsoft Teams, as they all provide a breakout room a feature. Uh, creating meaningful connections can be difficult in larger group settings, you know, especially if you have more than, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 students or more. Breakout rooms allow organizers to divide the, the meetings into subgroups to facilitate discussions and brainstorming sessions. So breakout rooms have the same features as the main room and they can be used to facilitate small group collaboration. You can use the uh, breakout groups to challenge your students, to allow students to work together in addressing questions, problems, case studies, something that you might offer your students. A moderator can create groups and they can place uh, the session attendees or students into these breakout groups. And they also have the ability to move around groups uh, to engage with students when they're working in groups. And so just as we can in a face-to-face -face environment where you may have students who are physically in the same location, but now you've separated them into groups. You can walk amongst them. You can peek in at, at maybe a, a group of, I don't know, four or five uh, students and then say, hey, do you have any questions? Or you can just listen to hear what they're, they're discussing, what their progress is on addressing a particular question or problem. Uh, yeah, without tripping over. <laughs> but yes, I've done that. I mean, it's funny you should say that because that has happened to be the past too, not being so involved with what people are saying, not watching where I'm walking. Okay, so it's important to have that ability to move around groups carefully and engage with students when they're working as, as, as group members. Now, to facilitate uh, uh, the uh, breakout room, let's see, students freak out when I, oh, yeah, no, okay, so <laughs> interesting you should say that because, um, uh, especially if it's online, in an online environment, it's kind of sort of like that creepy next door neighbor who is maybe on a, in the second floor bedroom looking out their window or maybe in, in your, they're, they're in a playhouse, uh, well, yeah, a clubhouse, a treehouse, in their back, and they're looking out a, out a little window to see what's going on. People can get freaked out by that, and I totally understand it. It's one of the reasons we'll be talking about uh, the need to explain to students why 
what is the use of uh, of uh, the breakout groups and all that? So just, you know, it's important that they know that it, it's being used to facilitate those small group collaboration efforts. Um, and that you as a moderator, you can create the, the breakout groups that are separate from the main room and you can assign participants to them. So those students will understand that. But also that breakout groups have their own feature set uh, in each one. They have their own private audio, video, whiteboard, uh, application sharing, and then chat. And any collaboration that takes place in a group is independent of the main room and other groups. They have their autonomy, they have their separation, their privacy uh, for the time that they're meeting. Uh, what is said or viewed in a breakout room will not be captured uh, in a recording, uh, but with limited exception. I'll, I'll come back to what is that, what is that exception? Um, because a lot of times when you start a recording in a session, you have breakout groups. That recording will only record what goes on in the main room. And so you're going to miss some of the uh, activity that's going on inside the, uh, the breakout rooms, which may be very helpful. Let's see. Without uh, they were asked, how would they share a whiteboard? Um, the workshop today is well. Actually, um, uh, they when you place students in a breakout room, they become a presenter. And so all of the features that you have the ability, uh, they will also have. Of course, you're going to have to show them how to use that. And part of that is on the lower uh, is on the lower right hand side. There's going to be that purple tab. It's going to open up, and it's going to give them the ability to share content. And one of those things is to share uh, share the whiteboard. Um, uh, that's uh, that particular question is probably more better addressed in another workshop that I have, which is actually the mechanics of creating uh, uh, groups, breakout groups. Um, but I'll be happy to follow up with you and and and, and talk to you after our session. All right. Oh, no, no, not at all. I mean, it's a fair question. It's a question I would ask if I was in this workshop. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the four steps in a breakout group. Um, and they include planning collaborative activities. Of course, you want to sit and, and, and very intentionally design what it is you want. Um, then it is to select and log into your web conferencing tool of choice. Uh, today we're using Collaborate, uh, but I could be using Microsoft Teams, and I do use Microsoft Teams a lot, a little less with Zoom. Um, and so that you create your breakout groups, you assign students, and then you run, uh, then you run the, the plan activities. So that that is the third uh, step, which is to create break, uh, breakout rooms and run assigning students and running activities. And the fourth step is to end the breakout groups and then debrief, which is really important. That's the whole reason why you do this is so that you have something to share. Okay, so we'll go through each one of these uh, activities uh, in in the course of time. All right, so. What can participants do in a breakout room? Okay, as I was mentioning, and, and thank you, Deborah, you actually anticipated me. Uh, every participant in the group is a presenter, and, and that that means that every uh, that all participants can share the whiteboard. They can share files. They can and applications with the rest of the group. Okay, let's see. Uh, they have. Uh, a, the students, the group members, should have one designated person to, to act as a scribe in order to take notes, and they would do that uh, so they could share afterwards when there's the debriefing that happens after the breakout group activity is over. Um, they, can, they can actually put their notes in a PowerPoint or in a Microsoft Word document and then save it as a PDF and then upload that file later on when they, when they uh, go back into the main, um, the main room. Uh, they should be prepared to debrief and share with the broader group. This is the function. This is one of the purpose of uh, the breakout room is to not just benefit from having interaction and, and then getting different perspectives from someone uh, someone else. It could be another person. It could be two other people, three other people. Uh, there's a certain point beyond which I think you will exceed the uh, the flexibility of breakout groups. If you have 10 people, that's far too many people, I think, to, to so that everyone gets an opportunity to share. But that's that's kind of an important aspect of it as well. So uh, there are some issues to consider. Uh, Got to ask yourself, what is the purpose of the synchronous breakout room session? It's not something you do just because you can. Um, there needs to be a, an, an actual explicit purpose, uh, and so. Uh, you know, if, if it's tied to something that we're doing in class, maybe it's tied to one of the learning objectives that you have for that week's work, 
absolutely if it's a way of, of addressing it is the instructor that would be you uh, are you being explicit as to its purpose in other words explain to the students why am i doing this activity why should i spend the next 10 minutes doing this what is the purpose of that like this and so it's very important that you make it clear to students why they're doing this um, is there a connection or to the module or course level learning objective and so if, if you have a question if you have an objective uh for that week for that week's material uh, then you have uh, maybe there's going to be a mechanism or learning activity that addresses that it might be this you know this group activity this this breakout group activity that you plan but of course you have to design it very carefully and, and with a great deal of intentionality does it have value well i mean that really depends on 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 the purpose um and and how well you design it obviously uh you may see think it has value because you think students can benefit from it but equally important, students really need to understand that it does have value and why it has value, how it has value. It's very, very important. Um, uh, the question is, is it uh, appropriate? Uh, is it an appropriate synchronous tool to use? Um, uh, we talk about the, the benefits of having a synchronous versus asynchronous response. So for me, one of the benefits of having a asynchronous response, and that could be maybe people are working together or, they, or they're doing something in a discussion board is that you have the opportunity to think a lot longer on something that you don't respond to something off the top of your head you can actually investigate it maybe go to the textbook maybe do some searching online maybe even ask the instructor uh, and and you prepare a response and then you share that with your colleague and your colleague who's doing the same thing will say well this is what's this what I learned well that that definitely has an advantage uh, but in uh, in this case right here we're using it uh, for sort of uh, on the spur of the moment, you know, uh, this is an opportunity. You may not have met your your colleague. It's an opportunity to meet somebody else who probably has a different perspective uh, on the content uh, than you do, and so you're going to both benefit from from that opportunity too. And it's happening in real time. Um, how does this learning activity fit in with the total course? Is it worth the time investment from a live session? And what possible uh, benefits to students? Uh, that the students uh, are derived can what are they going to walk away with? what are they you know how, how are they benefiting it is the activity used to support higher order learning or lower or, uh, order skills okay this is part of Bloom's taxonomy or the revised Bloom's taxonomy where we're trying to get people to go from just remembering things to actually analyzing synthesizing and creating new content uh, so this pro provides an opportunity to to do that as well so it supports learning um, very well um the question technology will students have access to the appropriate technology to fully participate that would be maybe technology and accessibility it's an important question i, I know that whenever i have my workshop uh with um, when, when i have online sessions i ask my students to be very careful about their their online connection uh, if they have if, if they can possibly use an ethernet connection please use that if they don't if they have wi-fi then i would have to make sure that their device is close to the router uh, so that there's not going to be any issues with breaking up or losing connection and, and this happens far too often i know that in dealing with faculty who call in for and and they're complaining about students you know just coming in and leaving coming in and leaving i don't think it's students coming and leaving just to be annoying it may be that their their device is not adequate and so students need to be aware of of how to address those technology questions and then the role of the moderator the, or or the instructor in, in the session well, and here's some things uh, uh, certain things that that they can uh, are responsible for so you as an instructor you can you, you're responsible for facilitating student activities uh, you can monitor the group uh, or the rooms uh, the breakout rooms you can provide options to change the name of breakout uh, breakout group and if students say well i think i would be more comfortable if it was called something something else you can move moderators or, or participants to different groups and so i as a moderator could could go into group one group two group three or i could put participants from one group into another group okay uh, then I, I, I'm also responsible as a moderator to end breakout groups, and of course it'll be after a certain uh, a certain time period, and I will have designated, let them know that hey, we're only going to go for five minutes or ten minutes, and I'll let you know one minute before. I'll send you a, a broadcast message saying hey, we've got one more minute prepared to be to come back into the main room. 
And then, of course, uh, you conduct the debriefing of the breakout group activity, gathering results and, and products of those breakout group activities that students have, have just spent five or ten minutes working on. So you, as the uh, instructor, the moderator, have a, uh, an important responsibility. So let's talk about, you know, I think it's the first of those three, uh, four steps is preparation. So in pre uh, uh, we're talking about prepping for a session for collaboration activities. Uh, do you create breakout groups in the session or do you plan them in advance? Now, sometimes you don't have that option. Um, uh, certainly one of the things that, that um, Blackboard Collaborate has been talking about for a long time is to have pre-existing groups outside of Collaborate and in the Blackboard course, and then using those groups when you are in your Collaborate session in the in the breakout group. That has been that's been one of my uh, on my wish list for Blackboard for a long time. Um, let me see. Uh, Deborah asked another tech question for later. Uh, would the students have to have a second computer to create a Word file? How would they run? Um, um, Blackboard and Word simultaneously. I so wish that they, <laughs> they would do that. Okay, so yeah, uh, I will respond to that uh, after after the session, and I'm happy to do that. It's actually not that difficult. Uh, it's just that you know, recognize that that the importance of audio, and so even though they may actually not be in that session, I mean, they might not be able to see it in their screen because they now have opened up a Word document. Uh, they should still be able to hear what's going on, and they can still share you know content back and forth. Let's see. Um, this is, how does the breakout group, uh, how, how does the activity, I should say, fit with the total course? Why are you using a breakout group activity versus something else? There has to be an overriding reason why you would choose to use that, that particular activity in that way. Um, is the activity tied to a module level objectives? I think that we talked about this just a short while ago. Um, you really, you don't do anything in your course that really isn't isn't tied to something. It, 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 it's not fluff. It actually has to be tied or connected. Uh, there should be an alignment between the uh, objectives of the course, uh, the, 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 the types of activities that you use, the content that you're using, the assessments that you're using. It should be a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one, um, uh, connection. Uh, so if you have an activity that doesn't really respond or, or, or address any of the objectives, or will be measured in any meaningful way in it, as an assessment, really, then, then then you have to ask yourself, is this an activity that makes sense to include? Is this a one-time activity, or is it a consistent pattern activity? I'd use it once or multiple times uh, using breakout rooms during a regularly scheduled synchronous session. Uh, and it's something the students need to, need to know. If students can expect to have this like this, then they'll be a little bit more psychologically prepared when it does occur. Um, uh, is there any preparatory material that students need to have reviewed in advance, like assigned readings or other content? When there might be a video that you have or an article that you want to share, and you're asking the students to please read that in advance, so that when they go into the the session, they will be prepared to have a meaningful discussion with their uh, their partner or partners. You have to decide how to design the learning activity that's based on a stated purpose, the module level objectives, and the materials used. So we're putting these all together. Um, and you want to make sure that all of them are being adequately addressed as well. Otherwise, it's you know st students won't won't see the connection. Sometimes you need to make explicit what that connection is, and so that's that's your opportunity to share that with students, so that students know, now they have a purpose for doing this activity. Uh, is there a reason to manually assign students to rooms, or can they be randomly assigned? And, and this really uh, addresses the issue that I had before of of uh, Blackboard Collaborate you know, where they were uh, talking about uh, tying groups that were created in Blackboard, the Blackboard course, and then bringing them in and, and having students work in uh, breakout room activities with a, uh, with a partner that has been assigned from previous time, as opposed to spending time manually putting people into groups or uh, randomly assigning people, which of course is the quick and easy way of doing it. Uh, but maybe that doesn't meet with your pedagogy, your rationale for having group activities. Maybe you want two or three people to be together all the time uh, for every every one of these sessions like that. So that's important. Uh, another is in your preparation is, is to be ready to uh, circulate. Now you can leave the main room and you can pop into breakout rooms. 
Um, Deborah was quite right when she said it may be a little surprising to students when they see you all of a sudden in their breakout room, but you tell them in advance that this is going to happen. Um, it's the virtual version of circulating uh, in your physical classroom only this digitally, of course, to check in on in groups. Uh, these uh, check-ins really allow you to clarify questions to build on student ideas um, and support. You know, so you're going in the right direction. You observe what's going on. Um, and you can move in and out of breakout rooms and, and uh, and you can also hold your students accountable for the learning task so the students know that, hey, you know, uh, the professor is going to come in the session. We better have something to show. And so let's talk. Let's uh, make sure that we're, you know, we're working on this stuff. You can also send messages. Uh, so you want to plan in advance. So when, when the teacher facilitates the small, group, uh, small groups in brick and mortar classrooms, they often really display a visual timer. Uh, or remind students how much time they have left. Now you can send a message from the main room to all breakout rooms uh, to keep your students on task, to share directions or to add other meaningful reminders. So the ability to send messages to all the groups, and you may have just uh, three or four groups, or you may have more. You want to, you don't want to have to go into each group and 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 pop in, share the message, pop out, go into some other room. You can do, you can broadcast them, uh, because. Working in breakout rooms is maybe new for students. You know, using the polling feature to gather student feedback once everyone is back in the main room is something you might want to consider. So if you plan to use breakout rooms consistently, it's important to find out what students' experience was like so you know what adjustments uh, or supports that you need to put in place. And so after the breakout room activity, so you might put out a poll that says, okay, we did, what was helpful in the breakout rooms? Did you experience any issue, uh, any technical issue? And then you might have students who are actually responding to that. And you say, yes, I did. I kept losing my connection or my, my partner kept disappearing. Okay. Okay, now pedagogy. Um, pedagogy, you, you, you decided you know, to offer synchronous class sessions with your students. But how do you make these lively, engaging, interactive, and, e and worthwhile? Well, simply transferring what you do in a land-based, in-person, face-to-face classroom uh, uh, to a virtual platform is not necessarily uh, a given or easily done. Video conferencing tools and platforms such as Blackboard Collaborate, Zoom, or Microsoft Teams are an intriguing medium. They can transform an online class into an active learning community. But to fully use the possibilities that these tools offer, you need to consider the specifics. Okay, just um, uh, the specifics of this medium and intentionally redesign the content and the learning activities for it. That's according to Hirsch, 2020. Now, students have reported feeling more motivated when they're asked to directly participate in synchronous remote classes. And many students are more comfortable engaging online in smaller groups than in front of the whole group. And this rings so true. How many, how many times uh, were you as a student in your younger years, you know, afraid to, to speak up when there was like 30 or 40 students in a classroom? But if you're, there's, there's just a few people, then you're more likely to, to speak up. You feel a little more confident and comfortable. Uh, and we're not just talking about intellectual engagement with course content, which is important to, to, to share and participate, but also human engagement. That's between faculty and students and, and with each other. You might consider the benefits of consistently putting your students into groups. Students benefit from direct interaction with their peers in small groups. For example, in Zoom breakout rooms, students can have a small group discussion. They can apply concepts. They can analyze a case or a situation, or they can solve a problem. A consistent structure reduces students' cognitive load, and it frees them up to engage with what matters most, the content. So here are some tips for helping students, uh, helping structure effective small group activities. Okay. So you might, you might want to give students a task, and you identify the, the, identify the pros and cons of an issue, uh, apply the concepts from the course text and or a pre-recorded lecture, and then ask them to analyze a case or situation or solve a problem. This is what I was talking about before. Have them in advance look at something, become educated uh, or exposed to some important concepts or, or information, and then have them come and do the work in this breakout group session. Also, you might want to uh, assign rotating roles. A uh, discussion facilitator who initiates a small group uh, discussion, that would be you, me, or anyone. Uh, you need to keep the group on track, so you, you want to have someone who is a note taker, uh, another person who might be a timekeeper, and maybe even a reporter if necessary. That would be the person who presents the findings. 
So that would be something that they might do in the session. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna report what we find. You know, making making that uh, important so that everyone has a task, a role, a purpose, and a direction. You would use a protocol that's strongly encouraged. Uh, you want to introduce students to discussion or small group uh, protocol. For example, tell them to do a circle of voices first, going around with each student sharing a thought or an idea or a comment before opening up the discussion. Give them sort of a direction getting started with. Um, Next tip is to use a note catcher. So ask your students to use the, uh, the collaborative note catcher that you created for their small group discussion. So that's, once again, that's just somebody who's taking notes. Um, Deborah asked a fair question about, well, you know, if, they, if they're taking notes, they might, you know, they have to take notes on something. And they could be doing that in uh, perhaps a, a Word document. Um, so that they're going to have to, obviously, if they have just the one screen, they're going to have to open up the, the Word document screen and, and work it. But they'll still be able to hear what's going on because they'll have, they'll have the, uh, the audio going. You want to be able to check in with the groups. You want to monitor the, you know, the, the note catcher and then check in with groups that, are, that may not be taking notes. And it says, uh, who is the note catcher? And someone else says, what do you mean? <laughs> all right, so this is very important before they all get distributed into the groups, as you say, there needs to be this, this, this exchange of roles. One of those important roles is somebody who's recording what you guys are talking about. Very, very important. Um, so maybe, maybe in the session, they're stuck. Or maybe they're so engaged that they're forgetting to take notes. This is, this is why you want to check in with the groups to make sure that that doesn't happen. You want to broadcast announcements to breakout groups. So you want to inform students about any remaining time left for the activity and when the breakout rooms, uh, room will close. You've got five minutes or, you know, or whatever it happens to be. You might want to ask students to reflect before you close the session. There are classroom assessment techniques. Um, uh, these are a great way to have students reflect on class session while providing the instructor with valuable feedback. So many of these um, um, many of these classroom assessment activities can, can be easily adapted for online use, such as using the chat or having students complete a brief uh, online survey before leaving the session. Uh, in my follow-up email to you guys after our session is over, I'm going to leave you uh, a link to, to look at some of those classroom assessment techniques uh, for yourself. Now, before we put students into breakout rooms, you want to explain when and how you will use breakout groups. But most importantly, you want to explain why you will use them. You want to show uh, you know, the connection between a particular objective that you're using for this week and what they're going to be doing. You might show them a short video that explains how the rooms work, or process, uh, model the process uh, so that they are familiar with it before they get into it. Otherwise, they may feel confused and lost, and that's you know that would defeat the purpose of uh, breakout group activities. You want to make sure that they're using their time wisely. So you want to create meaningful connections, you know, with the students with the content and with each other. Um, and that can be difficult in larger group sessions. This is the whole reason why we have breakout group activities, because it allows the organizers to divide the meeting into subgroups to facilitate those discussion and brainstorming sessions. Um, so your role in going in there, this is an important tip, to, is that to facilitate a small group collaboration. Um, this activity also provides a sense of immediacy and even a bit of intimacy in that because now you're just talking with a couple of people uh, or three or four people uh, instead of a large group which you may be uh, students may be intimidated by so moderators must see their role to facilitate student activities and that is your efforts as a moderator is to provide meaningful and significant experiences for your students as you teach in the course so uh, you don't really necessarily need to make a distinction. Oh, now we're doing this online. Just see the activity as working, is important working uh, in, in, in the course. Okay, There's nothing unique or special about it being online. It just happens to be online. But once they are, are so involved in the activity, that distinction will no longer be important that it's done online. It's, it's, it's like I'm sitting right here. I can actually see Deborah. Deborah has her, vid uh, her video. I can see it. it's like she's, she's sitting right in front of me like this. And so it's important that you create that, that sense of connection. Um, another related concept is that group or team members use the synchronous session as a time and a place to establish trust. Um, and then recognize that you don't have to do everything in a, in a synchronous session. Uh, you, you can trust your 
colleague to maybe follow up and continue on with the work outside of the session. So try it, and you might ask the students to try it once and, and reflect. And it's important to lower the stakes when you're introducing a new, new tool. So you establish a routine where students know that breakout groups are a consistent part of the learning online. So you start with a relatively low stakes activity, and then you start to build up as they get more familiar and confident in using this particular activity or participating. So there really is a need to debrief after the experience. This is important. Um, you want to make sure that they, the expectation is that they're going to share what their findings were. But you also want to know, uh, we also have them do a reflection of their experience. And so even beyond the, the uh, online synchronous session, you may actually ask them at the end of the week, uh, maybe as part of a journal reflection, uh, what did you find? you know, uh, useful uh, in this week's set of activities. Maybe specifically, did, did you get, gain anything from your uh, breakout group activity that we had on Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever it happened to be? So you can share that. So it's not just what they, what their product was from that activity. It's a reaction to the, to the activity itself. Because it, it could be that the students were not being very productive and they could explain why, you know, I didn't connect with my with my partner, or my partner wasn't saying very much, or I wasn't feeling very talkative that day, whatever it happens to be. So you use the breakout room activity to challenge your students. You allow students to work together in addressing questions, issues, or problems that you have developed, you have designed, and you have given to your students with the expectation that they'll, they'll be looking at it, investigating it, and exploring it together. Uh, and once again, you have the option when the activity is going on is to move around to groups to engage with students when they're working in their groups. So at this point, before we get into the comparison of the different web conferencing platforms, um, let's see. Hannah, Zach, Deborah, do you have any questions about the pedagogy, the rationale? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Deborah. So let's uh, let's uh, make a, a, a brief comparison. I, I would say that I'm not an expert in all of these different modalities. You know, Collaborate and Zoom and Microsoft Teams. I use all of them. Um, and when I did my investigation on what their feature set was for using uh, breakout group, uh, the breakout group feature, uh, is is that these things change sometimes uh, unexpectedly, sometimes without much fanfare. And so when I did my, my investigation, uh, uh, that was the state of the art at the time. And so something may have changed. Some things I wish changed have not yet changed, which is really frustrating. OK. So let's look at Blackboard Collaborate. One of the nice things with, with all of these is that there is this connection in Blackboard. Um, all of them have, you have access to all of them within your Blackboard course. But I think because Blackboard Collaborate has uh, been the one that's longest uh, that we've used in Blackboard, because it's integrated uh, with Blackboard, it's relatively easy to use. Um, when you're actually using, you're in a session, uh, if you're looking at the, the gallery view, uh, you can decide if, if, if uh, everyone in the session can, can use the gallery view, or it's just you, only Matt, or only you can, can use it. Uh, you can turn the gallery view off for everyone. So when you disable the gallery view, uh, up to four videos are visible, but you know, um, and then attendees can't choose to see more. Once again, pedagogically, what's the rationale? Why would you want to limit people's videos? Uh, one reason might be bandwidth uh, for your students. Students, you know, who are on iffy Wi-Fi. Yeah, that's, that might be a bit challenging. So you might decide to go with a, a smaller ga a gallery, a gallery view, which is important because, you know, you want to make sure that they're connected, they're listening to you while you're there, and before they get, they get separated into the breakout groups. So if you're familiar with Blackboard Collaborate, you know that you join through the, uh, the Blackboard Collaborate scheduler page. 
Unfortunately, you cannot pre-assign groups, students to groups. Uh, so this is having to do with what I had mentioned earlier about one of those features that we hope Blackboard eventually comes up with is that connection between groups that you've already created in your Blackboard course and then bringing them and using them into the breakout group activities. Still, I, I don't see that as, as, as uh, being implemented, but hopefully that is something that, that will in the near future. You can assign students to breakout groups manually or randomly. Okay. Um, all of these groups have all the features of the main group. Uh, oh, I know. Listen, okay, Deborah, uh, I've actually asked this question myself. And if you happen to have a GA, that GA could be uh, you give them a list. I want this person, these people in this group and all that. So sometimes we don't have that luxury. We, we don't have a, 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 a GA who can do that for us while we're in the session like this. So sometimes you're sort of tied to at least in, in Blackboard Collaborate, tied to this, um, uh, the need to randomly assign, and it's really frustrating. Let's see. Uh, you can upload content, um, PowerPoint, uh, PDF, uh, images in Blackboard Collaborate, which is great. You'll find out that's, that's one of the things that is limiting in the other two formats I'll be mentioning in just a minute. You can also share application screen. Instructions can push out content to each breakout room. Uh, it can all be the same content or individually uh, unique. You can send out messages to breakout rooms, and breakout uh, rooms can also send out a request for assistance. OK, once again, that's going to be one of those technical questions I'll be happy to, to, to talk about uh, after the session. Deborah, thank you for asking. Um, now, one of the things that's important is recordings do not occur in the breakout rooms. Once you leave the breakout room, uh, once you leave the main room, uh, that recording is not going to pick up anything that goes on there. Um, and the other thing, which is a downside, is you cannot reopen breakout groups. Once they're closed, that's it. It's over. Um, and so this is this is the real frustration. So this is so important when you are um, creating or designing breakout group activities. Do you want to have the same people in the same groups for multiple times? Then you're going to realize that's going to be a lot of work if I want to be able to do that. Uh, and so it may be that you use another tool. And so we'll be discussing the, uh, those other tools that may ha that may allow you to do that. Okay. Um, captions that are, are uh, in the session really are typed by a live captioner, um, and that's that's really important. Like this, but it has to be a live captioner. Okay. Our next um, web conferencing tool is Zoom. Uh, a lot of people. I've heard of Zoom, not just in <laughs> academic settings, but in every part of society. Um, it does have partial integration with Blackboard, which is kind of nice. You can create meetings, and you can share meeting IDs and password from a Blackboard course. But you don't want to share a link. You want people to actually get into the Zoom session from within the course. Uh, students have, have uh, you have students access to the NIU Zoom login or download the application. One of the nice things about Zoom is that you have a gallery view, uh, 25, 50 students. You can have you can have them a maximum view. Uh, you can join uh, through the Zoom portal or the desktop app. Um, now, supposedly you can pre-assign students to breakout groups. However, when I've done it in the past, it seems to be inconsistent. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. This is what I was talking about: is is an option to Blackboard Collaborate if you want to make sure that people go back into the same groups. However, my experience up to this point is that it is not consistently working. All right. So uh, you may end up doing what you did in Collaborate, which is to manually uh, assign people to groups or randomly assign them. Um, once again, breakout groups have all of the features of the main room. You have to use screen share. You can't upload files to Zoom, which, which for me is, is kind of a limitation. I, I'm not sure why that is. It may be changing or it may have changed already. I'm not aware of that. Uh, but that's kind of a big thing if you want to you want to show your PowerPoint uh, slides, like I'm doing right here in Collaborate. Uh, but if you do the share screen, then you open up Collaborate. If you have a, you know, the Blackboard program on your computer, then you just go to that particular screen and you share that. Uh, you can provide content in a Google Doc for groups to work on simultaneously. Um, and actually, you know, this might address your question, Deborah, about you know, how can people you know, how can people participate if one person is taking notes, but they're, you know. So if you have a Google Docs, that might be a Google Docs in one of the, one of the tabs that you have already opened, 
as a, as a group member and then have them work in their adding content while still being able to hear what's going on in the breakout groups, you know, via their audio. Uh, let's see. You can push out broadcast messages to breakout groups. Now, uh, this is the thing that distinguishes Zoom from the others. Recording follows the host into the breakout rooms if the host records locally. And I'm sure you're, you're aware that you can, you, when you are going to record, you can record locally or you can record in the cloud. But if the host records locally, when the students are going to the breakout rooms, the recordings will follow the host. So if I was using, uh, if I was using uh, Zoom and I was recording locally and I, I broke uh, you guys up into multiple groups, I could go into and anywhere I went, that recording would follow me, which is really kind of an, a cool tool, um, uh, a feature set. But you don't get that option if you record in the cloud. Um, instead, you just get pauses in the recording and resume when everyone returns to the main room. Uh, however, one of the advantages, and this is to consider, you can reopen breakout groups after closing them. So if you create your breakout groups there in, in Zoom like this and you, you close them, you can have them go back into the same room, which actually might encourage you to say, well, I think I'm going to use Zoom for this, this session because um, I can have people meet multiple times over the course of a, particular, a session. The same people meet over for different uh, breakout group activities. Okay, so one of the nice features too is that there's auto transcription, which is great. You know, whatever is is being recorded um, and and listened to, it actually takes that sound and and able, and uh, converts it into speech. Uh, and then Microsoft Teams, um, once again, it's integrated in the NIU community. I believe we all use Microsoft Teams here at, at NIU. Um, you have to put the Teams meeting information into the course. There is an auto transcription feature, which once again is nice. You can have a maximum view of student galleries, uh, I think up to 50. Um, a large gallery view is available when at least 10 people have their cameras turned on. Okay, so that's sort of the, the limitations. When there are more than 49, you might get a seven by seven meeting view of, uh, of all those people that, that are partic uh, participants that in, in a Teams meeting. Um, and you'll see them all in a gallery uh, with page. So if there's more than 49, so you have the maximum 49 on one page. If you've got another 49, uh, then you'd have page two and it would have all of those uh, individuals. Um, now, although you can't pre-assign students to breakout groups in Microsoft Teams, you can create Teams channels and then add students to each channel and then uh, have students join the channel at a time to engage in the activity. So they go back and forth from your session into the, the channel and they'd be able to work with, with that. Um, or you can assign students to breakout rooms manually or randomly. Breakout rooms have all of the features, once again, as a main room. Uh, you can use the share screen, but you, once again, you can upload files to the Microsoft Teams. You can suggest our, our providing content in a Google Doc for groups to work on simultaneously. And then also you can push out uh, broadcast messages to, uh, to breakout groups. Um, and recordings do not occur in the breakout room activities. Okay, I'm going to move on here. Keeping time. All right, so I'm going to have some uh, asking questions. Do you have any questions specifically about those three different web conferencing tools or format? I know that uh, Deborah has asked a few questions, and I'm happy to respond after the session, uh, today's session. But do you have any any <laughs> questions that you have that need to be answered right now? Hannah? Zach? All right, Deborah says no. Okay, good. Well, we're going we're gonna to go on to some examples. Um, uh, and, and given that we don't have a lot more time left, I'm going to go over these as quickly as I can. Uh, the first example is Think Pair Share. Okay, Think Pair Share. I think Probably all of you must have heard of this and from some workshop. Oh, really, Hannah? Oh, oh, good for you. You get to learn something new today. All right, so think pair share. So this active learning strategy really involves posing a short problem or a scenario or, or question to your students, and then give them time and opportunity to complete the following steps. All right, so first you give them that information, then they think about the problem or the scenario or the question individually, okay? Then you pair them with a partner to discuss it. So now they've spent some time reflecting on it original, uh, uh, initially. Now they're part, uh, paired with someone to discuss this. Then they share their findings or takeaways with the rest of the class. So you share the information, 
you give them an opportunity to think about it individually. Then you, give, you pair them with an, uh, somebody, say, turn to the person on your right or left or whatever, and then discuss this. And then after their discussion, they can share that with the rest of the class. Now, this strategy not only gives your students time to process and apply their knowledge and skills uh, of their own first, but it also gives them the opportunity to consult and collaborate with a peer. So this process usually elicits more uh, thoughtful responses while also lowering the stakes of sharing with the rest of the class because it's only with one other person at the time. So you might want to use this think, pair, share activity uh, in the breakout rooms. So if you were using um, Zoom, the, what tools would you use? Well, you, you, you'd use the share, the, the share screen feature, okay? Uh, and then of course the breakout rooms. And, or if you're using, uh, if you're using um, uh, Blackboard Collaborate, you would use, like we're doing right here, I, I've got my PowerPoint presentation right here, and I have that question for them to look at, and, and then I, I, I do the, the breakout room uh, activity. I, I, I put them into their, their rooms. Or I could just randomly assign them two to a group. And then so they won't, they might, might even have the, not have an opportunity to choose. I want to talk with, with, with Amy or I want to talk with, 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 with George or whatever it happens to be. It'll just be random. Uh, and the amount of, of pre-class preparation isn't great. Maybe less than 15 minutes for, for an instructor to think about the questions they want to do or whatever. And for the student themselves, not a whole lot of activity too. They show up and they, and they read the question. Hopefully they will have prepared for a response. And, and then there's actually the, the, the implementation where, once again, uh, first they think about a, 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 a problem or, uh, and then they reflect on it and then they pair up with somebody else and then they share with, with the group after their, their discussion. Okay. Uh, now there's, there's an example that, that, I, that I've used in the past. This is one from uh, an astronomy class at Cuesta College. Uh, and they use flashcards in a peer instruction. This is a uh, think pair share. It's an interactive learning environment. The instructor really sees the feedback from students' response to a multiple choice question. So if the responses are only 30 to 70 percent correct, then students are given about a minute to explain to a neighbors and neighboring students why they chose their response before responding with flashcards again. I actually have an example of one. I'll send you a link to this in the follow-up email, but it's a very, very intriguing way to, to um, <laughs> uh, uh, how this is being implemented. Okay, so another example, small group discussions. Um, small group discussion uh, are one way for students to delve more deeply into a given problem or issue. You can pose an open-ended question or a problem or provide students with a scenario or case study, like you did with a pair share. The duration is dependent on the task. Students can then present their results or findings to the rest of the class. So it sounds very similar to that, um, but uh, there is no real reflection. You just jump right into it. Uh, hold on, let's see. So you want to reflect on the learning objective that would be most bene uh, that would most benefit uh, from the small group discussion discussion activity. So you as the instructor, so you're thinking about okay, this is my objective, my learning objective. Uh, how am I going to use this activity to have students benefit from this? So from this learning objective, you want to develop a discussion prompt that will assign your students to, for example, learning objectives. Um, maybe the learning objective is to have them analyze figure three of the assigned research article. Okay, they would have read this article. So the discussion prompt might be, how well does the data shown in the figure support the author's claims? And so you take, they're going to take that or they're going to discuss it. Now, when assigning the group uh, discussion, be sure to include the clear instructions on what your students are supposed to do. So, for examples, um, how many students will be in each group, how much time they'll have for the discussion, what they need to report back to the class, and how much time they have to do it, and upholding any discussion guidelines that they previously agreed to. Okay, so these are some ways of, of doing that. Uh, so small group discussion and reporting out. Now think about your groups ahead of time. You can randomly assign groups, uh, students to groups of a particular size, or you can manually assi assign them, which, which as Deborah mentioned, is, is, is kind of onerous sometimes, <laughs> unless you have somebody helping you while you're discussing and explaining the activity, and you have maybe a GA who will be able to, to do that for you. 
Uh, if you have a discussion uh, board groups or group projects, you can assign the same groups for breakout groups, and so you'll have to know that in advance. This is the advantage, once again, if Blackboard would have the ability to have those groups to also be in that you created in this in the Blackboard course to bring them into the Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, it's nice to be to keep groups consistent for a few sessions so that that students get to know uh, one another. Now, supposedly groups of about five tend to be a nice size. It's, it reaches critical mass, so you have enough people to to provide different input, different perspectives, but not too many people. You want to want the groups to be small enough so that's easy to jump into the conversation, but big enough that there's there are different ideas and perspectives. Um, even if someone has technical difficulties or steps away from their computer, you have you still have a certain number of people who are able to uh, to participate. Now, when the students go to the breakout rooms, they won't be able to see your slides anymore. So if there are particular questions you want them to discuss, uh, have those available perhaps maybe in a shared Google Doc that everyone can see um, that you already have opened up for them or ask them to open up for you. Uh, you can use the instructor and can visit uh, breakout rooms to participate in their conversation. Then you can answer their questions. You can also send a co-host to a particular breakout room. So once again, if you have a GA, you might want to have them go in there and then and then provide some assistance. Once those people are in, uh, the students are in the breakout rooms, uh, you can move them to different groups, uh, different rooms if if you want to. Uh, let me just see in the broadcast message. Uh, so Deborah says, I just figured out yesterday that you can rename groups yes in Blackboard Collaborate. So we use novel titles and then had students assigned to them. It took time, but eventually worked. And I think when people identify with a particular uh, group name, it's great. When I create group activities in my course, uh, I, I create like uh, I teach in ethical decision making for healthcare professionals, and so I have students with teams like Team Beneficence or Team Veracity or or, or uh, Team Informed Consent. They're meaningful to the students. Okay, let's see. I am going to, it's going to go through this right here. Brainstorming is another activity where you have, uh, people have the opportunity to write text simultaneously on a shared whiteboard or prepared PowerPoint slide and using annotation functions to use the chat function to write down their ideas. Okay, peer editing and feature. I like this uh, activity as well because you can use breakout rooms to put students into pairs or smaller groups for peer editing and feedback. So students can work in breakout groups uh, rooms to share drafts and they can give feedback. They can also complete review outside of class and then use breakout rooms to provide feedback or, or they can work through a, a Google document uh, without live feedback. Okay, project-based learning. Uh, collaborating in small groups to solve problems and works toward completing a larger task are really at the heart of problem-based learning. Breakout groups are an ideal space for students to meet in their groups and to move the project forward. Okay, and this last one right here, this is Four Corners Debate. So in the main room, you want to share a statement with your students, tell them that there are four stances that they can take, strongly agree, agree, strongly disagree, and, agree, and disagree. Give students time to think and make a choice. Students type their stance into the chat and then place students into the breakout rooms based on their chosen stance. So once in the room, students develop an argument and choose a group speaker. Uh, when everyone comes back, each speaker sh shares uh, out and students can type in the chat if they've changed their minds. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think that's all we have. All right. So we are at our end point. Uh, are there any questions? Deborah, I promise to respond to you. Hannah, do you have any questions? Mm, I'm not seeing any. I'm going to stop the recording now then. Oh, you're welcome, Hannah. <laughs>